Welcome everyone to this webinar. This is the last webinar uh, for 2017. And uh, as usual, we're dealing with a topic that interests uh, a lot of people, as we do with many of our topics. And this is a webinar that we will record and disseminate out and distribute out to a lot more people. And it, it's a, a webinar that's really interesting to many people because one of the things that's happened since the Second World War is that the judiciary system has become increasingly important, both in the United States, where Zena, who is going to speak to us in a minute, comes from, and in the United Kingdom. And in the United States, one of the things that's happened, as in the United Kingdom, is that uh, since the war, and through the FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt period there on, there became a lot more regulation, and lawyers had a lot more work to do in terms of protecting individuals and citizens from the state. But what's happened in the period of neoliberalism is that corporations have become mini-states and have got much larger. And actually protecting citizens from corporations um, has also become important. But when corporate lawyers inter sort of uh, twine with the uh, legal system itself, the judiciary system, a lot of questions get raised about its independence. And in the United Kingdom, where um, we've also had issues like devolution, which has led to questions about, you know, what does Scotland do in terms of its parliament and what does um, the United Kingdom parliament do um, when we've had other things happening as well, like the Human Rights Act. It's meant that lawyers have had to take a line which appears to be more political than they did in the past. And that raises a lot of questions about how can the judiciary be independent and how can we ensure, if we can ensure, that it is. Anyhow, Zina is going to talk to us around this now. And she's going to talk for about um, 20 minutes. And then, while she's speaking, if you've got any questions or comments, please type them in the chat box. Thank you, Zina, for doing this and joining us. This is the second webinar you've done with us, and I'm sure we'll do more in the future. So I'm going to hand over you now to give your view about the independence of the judiciary. Well, thank you so much, Francis, and thank you, everyone, for joining us at this uh, last Global Net 21 webinar of the year. And um, I really appreciate your attention um, and moving away from your uh, holiday celebration to address this important topic. Judicial independence is a phrase and a concept that's very familiar to me as a good government advocate focused primarily on the administration of justice here in, in America. In fact, the topic is so familiar to me that, that it, it took preparing for this webinar to remind me of how unclear the definition is of judicial independence. Uh, unclear in that there is no one way that the concept is perceived or defined. And I know that from interacting over the years with, with many, many good government advocates. And I also synthesize relevant, relevant input from several law professors, most of which, most of the professor's input I share in a book of mine is titled Exploring the Vitality of Starry Decisis in America. And for those who don't, may not know, uh, stare decisis is, is also referred to as the doctrine of precedent, which is, you know, basically the idea, the notion that what has been decided, um, judicial decisions should be followed um, in, in, in subsequent um, cases unless there are specific circumstances that warrant a, a, a departure from, from past judicial rulings. So um, I know based on, again, interacting with uh, good government advocates and, and the research that I, I completed uh, for, for my book and input I received from, from multiple U.S.-based law professors that we should you know, probably be, be begin, in fact, we need to begin this webinar by considering what judicial independence entails or, or perhaps I should say what the phrase means. So what I'll do 
today uh, for our for our webinar is share um, share with you at least some of the definitions or descriptions of, of the concept that that I've encountered the concept of judicial independence and if any one of our, our live audience members is is aware of a different me meaning prescribed to judicial independence different than, than anything that I mentioned during during the course of my presentation I certainly encourage you to share that input um, during through the comments section or, or during our Q and A session, I you know I have to admit I, I'm I'm tempted to to make a very academic or legalistic presentation that's full of written quotes and citations because I suspect that may allow us to have a more accurate consideration of judicial independence in a world that's increasingly dominated by by global corporations as Francis. Um, suggested in his in his presentation or, or established in his presentation. But I know that approach would bog us down and we have a relatively lot of ground to cover in a short time. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll direct you to my book. At, at the end of my presentation, I'll give you a link to it. And also I'll, I'll reference other publications where you can find the full presentation of what I'm referencing or, or what I'm mentioning in my, in my uh, oral presentation. You find the full quotes in, with citations. So, you know, please don't think that I'm just making a shameful plug of, of my publication. Now, this is not in any book, but my impression is that many people think judicial independence um, is the absence or and, uh, really the antithesis of judicial accountability. Uh, they, this school of thought seems to equate judicial independence with a perceived uh, ability of judges to act with impunity to essentially do whatever they want to do in the course of resolving legal uh, disputes, regardless of the law that's on the books, so to speak. Then there's another school of thought, another you know, um, way of looking at the situation that I, I've uh, encountered. And this is, has some people characterizing judicial independence as the freedom of judges to, to fairly and, and partially resolve legal disputes that are before them. So you know, I, I immediately um, started seeing the, the, the dichotomy of judges being perceived as free or independent to do, to do you know, what would be considered wrong, um, which I would you know, suggest is disregard applicable law. And, and then you have this perception that, that judges are free to do what is right, which would be fairly interpret and, and imply law. Um, what this uh, dichotomy between uh, right and wrong, freedom to disregard or apply the law, that notion or that phenomenon you know, started to suggest to me that the question of, of what judicial independence entails could easily morph into a consideration of, of what constitutes the rule of law. Uh, in other words, you know, just how bound are judges to comply with precedent, judicial rulings, um, as well as duly enacted statutes, rules, and, and regulations. But you know, that's another topic, um, you know, so we'll, 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 um, but I do want to know how, how closely related they, they, they are or can be and how one consideration judicial independence can morph into, you know, what, what does it, what does it um, compliance with the rule of law actually entail? But back to our subject at hand, uh, my book uh, extensively quotes a professor, Drew Lanier, who, of course, presumes judges are obliged to comply with the rule of law in America. But he essentially describes judicial independence as the perception of judges that they can do their jobs as they see fit without suffering direct backlash, any type of uh, serious direct backlash from powerful forces that, that simply prefer different judicial outcomes. You know, so they're, 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 the, the judicial independence is not so much begrudging um, uh, the, the ability of a judge to be appealed or perhaps disciplined, um, but 
more a, a concern that a judge can do what he or she believes sh should be done or is consistent with with um you know his or her job as a judge without suffering uh backlash from perhaps other branches of government wealthy and powerful corporations special interest groups um just who just simply have a different way of looking at things and and, and would prefer that that uh, a judge rule in a, in a different direction um, that kind of direct backlash could be something like losing your job, being fired, um, being impeached. Um, uh, so what happened is, well, let me let me mention uh, a professor, Vincent Johnson, who's also featured in my book. Professor Johnson notes that U.S. federal judges uh, would be the most independent per, per Professor Lanier's criteria for for um, what it takes for a judge to feel independent. Uh, let me. I'm going. I am going to read um, a quote of of um, from Professor Lanier. The structural elements he believes is required to accomplish judicial independence are judicial salaries that cannot be reduced while the, the judge is in office, a fixed judicial tenure, um, and uh, judicial selection through executive appointment that is checked by some other actor or through direct uh, election. So uh, Professor Drew Lanier is, is of the opinion that you need to have those three elements in place in order for judges not to uh, perceive that that how they do to do do their job can can um, evoke the wrath of some powerful uh, force that can actually go about and remove them from office, re reduce their salary, uh, subject them to some type of um, negative uh, and serious consequence. Now, what Professor Johnson was saying is again, you know, federal judges in, in, in the United States would be would would be the most protected because they they have the most protection in our country from um, being removed based on, you know, a philosophical uh, disagreement by powerful uh, interests, other branches of government, and, and special interest groups, not to mention powerful corporations. But what um, Professor Johnson noted, and I, I tend to agree, is that our federal judges, U.S. federal judges, have not seemed any more inclined than our state judges. Uh, to act independent of extrajudicial influences. So again, I, you know, in, in, in the United States, the state judges tend to be particularly vulnerable to, to backlash. A lot of them uh, are, are selected through election and they can, you know, be, campaigns can be mounted and get them removed from, from offices if they take an unpopular stand. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's always maneuvering in state legislators, tinkering with um, the budgets of state courts. But, you know, I would say that, you know, our state judges still tend to, to do their job as they, as they perceive it to be, um, you know, without regard for these considerations. So that reality suggested to, to Professor Johnson that judicial ethics and honesty among judges are just as, if not more important in preserving the rule of law as, their, as the perception of judges of freedom from external pressures. Now, of course, our, our global corporations are the potential source of extrajudicial pressure that we're considering today. You know, one of the first things that come at mind come to mind is is you know back alley uh, bribery, um, the staggering wealth of global corporations certainly equips them to be part of graft, which is the dishonest and, and otherwise illegal use of official power uh, for personal gain by one or more public officials, which you know, can include judges. I'm not suggesting anything about the, the propensities of corporations to, to engage in, 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 in graph-oriented um, schemes. I'm just saying they certainly have the wealth to, to um, enter in a situation where a judge is, is using his power, exercising uh, his, his or her authority as a judge, um, and, and being primarily motivated by um, personal gain, securing uh, money or securing other, some other type of property. Um, corporations are, and particularly large corporations, are particularly equ equipped to, to, as we say in the States, pay to play. Um, then there's the, the concept of corporate imperialism, 
which is about corporations endeavoring to enter and dominate consumer markets. So limiting corporate liability and the corresponding cost of doing business is a natural part of a corporation's um, interest in, in dominating a, a consumer market. And judges can be as helpful as in, in limiting corporate liability um, as, as a legislator. You know, we, 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 we often have legislation being enacted on the state and federal level in our country that limit, um, you know, liability for corporations with regard to products and premises. And, um, you know, to the extent that there's not specific statutory uh, legislative limitations on liability, the interpretations, the rulings of judges, um, the inclination of a judge to determine that a, a corporation was not liable for, for a certain set of circumstances can be just as effective. But, you know, we should keep in mind that our focus for, for today's women, uh, webinar is on judicial systems. Um, our, question, our, our question is is not so much whether judicial uh, independence can succumb to graft our corporate uh, imperialism in, in in any given instance because obviously it can. I mean, there's judges who who are you know, are going to be you know willing to be bribed. There there are judges who are going to want to play um, you know an active part in uh, facilitating the the dominance of of, of private corporations, um, you know, to the point of, of a conspicuous, unlawful, improper bias in favor of, of um, you know, large corporations. But the more pressing consideration for, for our purposes is, is just how susceptible are entire judicial systems to undo corporate influences. And uh, does judicial independence adequately insulate national legal systems from undue corporate influence you know so that's that's more of what we're looking at so not so much you know um how judges respond to to the money and power and influ influence uh, of corporations but but you know how how much can an entire legal system and or an entire ju ju uh, judiciary um um how, how well insulated is the entire judiciaries from, from that type of um, influence. Uh, a, a portion of, of my book, a good portion of it, suggests that there's actually a very serious threat to judicial independence that's presented by powerful corporate, corporate interests. Interest. And, and that threat has nothing to do with tapping into any form of ethical shadiness among judges. The, the the threat that that I I'm referencing that's discussed in my book pretty pretty extensively. It's not a long book at all, um, but the threat it it addresses um, quite a bit is it stems from the ability and the propensity of large corporations to usher onto the judicial benches uh, benches of a of a nation judges whose mindset is shaped by years of corporate defense. And I'm not sure what the case is in, in the UK, but it's my understanding that in America, former government and former corporate lawyers literally dominate our federal and state judiciaries. You know, it's very uh, relatively rare for um, a lawyer who did not come out of that background to, to ascend to, to um, the state, the highest levels of state and federal uh, judiciary, um, the more influential courts. And of course, this relatively homo homogeneity of a nation's uh, judiciary, I, I want to emphasize that that doesn't mean, that's not synonymous with, with cons conspicuous judicial bias. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, most people, most lawyers uh, and, and who, who have the, the um, ability to, you know, survive, um, extend to the bench probably have enough intellectual um, discipline to you know understand what 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 the task of being fa a fair and an impartial resolution of a case entails um, so it's not so much about you know someone sitting at the bench and you know having a very conspicuous being bound and determined to rule um, in favor of of um, 
you know, people who, who come out of the same environment in which they, they worked, uh, corporate environment or government a- environment. Instead, the problem of this homogeneity is, is, is there's inadequate counterbalancing of perspectives. Um, and under those circumstances, a, a judge can be un- unwittingly shackled by a, a, a mindset. Are, are, are um, his or her pro- proclivities. Let me let me try to make it, uh, that point a little bit more clear by by um, referencing uh, another professor uh, mentioned uh, quite a bit in my in my book, Professor Jeffrey Rechlinsky. and his expl- explanation is that judges who themselves spent themselves spent most of their careers in loyal and honest service to institutions might feel um, little need to allow open-ended investigations of these institutions by p- private actors through civil litigation. And again, it's, you know, it's not so much that these judges you know, have, have, have um, uh, a very conscious determination to, to rule in favor of um, corporations or, or government, um, and it, 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 instead, it, it may be that e- even if they perceive a problem and a need for reform of an institution, they just, you know, simply tend to trust those institutions and the ability of those institutions to, to uh, accomplish the appropriate reform and perhaps think that, that the institutions should, per, should precipitate the reform um, more than uh, an individual um, through, through litigation, civil litigation. Um, you know, the, the notion that, that reform should be precipitated by the institution more than a, um, some disgruntled individual. And that person may be disgruntled because he or she is a former employee or perhaps someone who um, was injured by a, a corporate product. And, you know, when 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 a judge has come from these institutions and 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 has been loyal and honest and 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 and, and in working in in that environment they just may simply trust that those institutions are are better equipped to to make to do what is necessary to do what is right to do what serves the common good um and should have the flexibility to do that without being shackled by you know perhaps large monetary um uh, penalties are are a consent de- decree. Um, you know, I, I, I'm get, I, perhaps you're getting the impression that that what constitutes undue corporate influence is is somewhat subjective. It can be in in the minds of the in the eyes of the beholder. Um, some of us are more inclined to um, reverence individual rights and and and. Um, uh, the wisdom uh, of the individual and and, and the uh, you know the sovereign uh, citizenry, and there are some people who may be more inclined to think that large corporations better embody the, the greater good, the common good, and better serve the common good that, than individuals who, admittedly, you know when you're when you're um, attempting to secure relief. In, in, in through litigation, um, while while your 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 claim could be very much a public interest matter, you you know we we are motivated by um, personal recovery, and so um, there are just simply going to be some people who think that that um, corrupt the corrupting effect of um, you know a personal recovery. It, it, um, has a negative impact, impact on, uh, on serving the, the uh, public good more than investing um, that responsibility, uh, trusting the judgment of, of the large corporation. Um, what I've done is I've long advocated the need for mechanisms that br- bring societal pressures to bear by majorities and minorities, corporations and individuals, the weak and the, and the powerful. So that American judges, at least, would be wise to to reasonably factor all relevant perspectives in judicial decision making. That's that's been my quest to make sure that you know all the um, stakeholders 
uh, are adequately represented. Their, their concerns, their interests, their preferences uh, are fairly considered uh, by, by um, our judiciary. But unfortunately, that kind of level uh, playing field is far from, from reality in the United States as of yet. Now, I'm just about ready to wrap up, but I want to share with you an, a pretty ominous quote that uh, my co a co colleague of mine shared with me from, a, from the book that's titled When Corporations Rule the World by David C. Corton. And this is a 1995 publication, but, you know, the, the language still resonates quite a bit today. He, uh, Corton explained that corporations, and again, this is in 1995, he explained that corporations have emerged as the dominant governance, governance institutions on the planet, with the largest among them reaching into virtually every country of the world and exceeding most governments in size and power. Increasingly, it is the corporate interest more than the human interest that defines the policy agendas of states and international bodies, although this reality and its implications have gone largely unnoticed and unaddressed. Again, you know, for, it's quite possible that well-meaning um, ethical people um, can, can see, see things differently. It's, it's, it's very much about perspective, and that's why it's so important that our judges have a, a good balance of perspective and perspectives. And, and what has happened in the United States is while we have uh, a lot of judges who hail from the government or private corporate backgrounds, the, 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 the counterbalance uh, has been, uh, there's been an attempt to have a counterbalance by having diversity with regard to gender, having diversity with regard to race, uh, having diversity with regard to religious background. But in, in my view, I'm inclined to think that even those considerations still fall short of um, having, you know, the, the adequate, adequately leveraging the perspective that comes from, from, from being um, a, a former um, part of these institutions, government and corporate institutions that, that um, are, are presenting their, their, uh, their preferences as part of, of, of civil litigation. So hopefully this presentation at least begins to suggest that major corporations can do a lot to skew court proceedings and, and, and they can do that without having to engage in any type of uh, criminal activity or rely on de deliberately unfair um, judges. And we should, you know, continue to, to monitor, you know, the type of public policy uh, implications of day-to-day -day judicial rulings. Okay, thanks. That was a, a very thorough explanation and we're getting quite a lot of questions up already, which is really good. I mean, Neil's put a string of questions up, all of which are very interesting. And one of his uh, sort of continuous themes is that, um, you know, you've said um, uh, judges should be honest and that's very important and that mm -hmm. is uh, a precondition to their independence. But Neil is saying, how can you expect judges to put people before profit, community before corporations, when there is so much money around at stake, because it's money that calls the tune? <laughs> well, um, you know, the, in theory, that is supposed to be handled at the selection process. And it's my view that uh, citizenries of a, of a country are simply going to have to be more engaged and, and, and um, you know, to ensure that during the selection process uh, that, that, um, that judges are, are um, make, you know, make, making representations that suggested that, you know, their part, they're, they're going to the bench um, to serve something other than, you know, their financial interests. Uh, law lawyers have the choice of staying in the private sector where, you know, there's not these type of impediments on, on your income, um, you know, motivations. So if a, a lawyer makes a conscious choice to, to join the bench, then he or she should, should it's, not, it's only reasonable to expect that they're not doing it as part of a pro profit motivation. And if, if at any point they are, then they should, all they have simply have to do is go back into the private sector. Okay. And um, Neil, again, uh, says that uh, 
you know, at school, children are taught that uh, getting profit, getting money, getting jobs, economic growth, wealth are all really, really important. And um, they're educated in a certain way. And to some extent, judges have come up in mm-hmm. that particular environment. Now, how do you provide the education for judges so that they understand their other pressures? For example, you know, in this country, and I'm sure in um, America as well, judges have never, until they were forced to, understood about the black minority in America, never understood in this country in America about trade unions, never understood about the role of women. So how do you create a judiciary that has an understanding of what society is rather than what the elites are? Well, one thing that will certainly help is is, is if the judiciary is more of a reflection of the varied um, um, social economic backgrounds of, of the citizenry that they're serving, that, that will certainly help. And again, um, the, the, the um, profit motive, the interest in making large sums of money, um, it does not have to be surrendered. Any, any um, par- person who's part of the legal profession, any, any lawyer can, does not have to give that up. They just simply can, can um, pursue it as part of the private sector. But the function of um, a judge is to help ensure a fair and impartial administration of justice for a country and, and, and not, um, you know, go in and, 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 and um, you know, line their own pockets, um, you know, enrich him or herself, or be a part of directing uh, undue uh, wealth and power and influence to to uh, various um, you know private interests. So, when a, a judge ascends to the bench and that is his or her conscious goal, then what you have is um, a judge that's engaged in unethical conduct and and perhaps criminal conduct. And then it's a matter of uh, are the oversight, government oversight uh, mechanisms in a country um, uh, extracting appropriate uh, accountability in light of a judge that's, that's operating in, in, in that way? Um, another thing to keep in mind is a lot, a lot of times very wealthy lawyers in our country go to the bench um, after they've made their wealth. And at that point, their interest is in, you know, refining um, jurisprudence and and they're not so much uh concerned about how much they earn because you know they they have all the wealth that they 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 want to accumulate that happens a lot with regard to who becomes president oh okay um we've been talking about judges um making decisions between two parties or more they have to to make a decision about the law but both neil and tim have actually made the interesting point Nowadays, a lot of laws, and he and and Tim uh, cites the European Union, a lot of laws are drafted by corporate lawyers. Mm -hmm. So that what you have is judges making decisions about laws that have been drafted by the big corporations. So in a way, it's not the judge's fault. They're one step away from a corporate structure that makes the legal system what it is today. Yes, but you know the the difficulty is is that um, getting accountability with regard to the judges uh, can be a bit more complex than getting accountability with regard to our legislators. It's it's just a matter of um, election, uh, um, you know, electing or unelecting your your legislator. Whereas, um, you know, establishing that that a judge is is somehow uh, making decisions that not within the lawful range of, of um, you know, without, well, not within the range of lawful uh, judicial outcomes becomes a bit more complicated. You know, it's, 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 it's all about, a lot of this ultimately comes to a consideration of the effectiveness of democracy, the viability of democracy in our country, because, um, you know, it's very difficult to influence government on a grassroots basis, even though in a democracy, technically, private citizens have all the power they need. They just have to be willing to um, marshal that, harness that power and, you know, make it felt there there will be felt at the ballot box. Nothing has changed. It's just not very easy to, to, um, you know, uh, 
um, get citizens focused on playing their role and making sure that all branches of our government pro uh, function properly. Um, da David uh, Wostowski um, actually met, uh, gives a quote from Frederick uh, Bastias, which is quite interesting. He said, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living within a society, they create for themselves over time a legal system that endorses it and a moral code that glorifies it. And that's quite an interesting quote. How do you stand on that? That's certainly for true. And, um, you know, um, but, but, but the wonderful thing is that it amazes me that as much as I see departures from, from, from you know, uh, our constitutional rights in, in this country and, and, and um, you know, federal and state court rulings, the, the law in theory, the, the black letter of the law is, is tends to be perfectly suited for protecting individual rights. And the big problem that we identify, the big problem that we've identified in this country, the big culprit, is the relative obscurity of our court's operation. You know, they're making de daily decisions that not only affect the lives of the particular litigants uh, uh, before them, but also have implications for the larger society. And um, our, but our country, our citizens are just not paying attention to, to what's happening in our courts the way they do um, with what happens in our legislators and in our executive branches. And that's why, you know, we, we are, my organization are, is a big part of trying to change that. And we appreciate you know, this outlet that we have through Global Net 21 to, you know, continue to cur encourage citizens across the world to, to pay more attention to the powerful impact of the judiciary and judicial decisions. Just to change the subject and to take Michelle's question, she asked a simple question, are state and federal draft judges offered different forms of police protection? Now, I'm not sure what's behind that question, but what I suspect is behind it is that judges have come under a lot of, you know, hate in recent years, particularly in this country after the Brexit um, debate, and when they um, made a decision in, in, in favour of someone over here called Gina Miller, who put the case that Parliament should make the last uh, decision and not the executive, and they ruled in favour of Parliament. They got a lot of death threats, they were called enemies of the people, and, um, you know, the, the question of police protection for them comes up. So corporations can um, influence judges, but populism and mass hysteria in the population can do the same, can't it? Oh, for sure, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I have uh, often indicated that we, we have to be some of the biggest champions of our judiciaries and judges as, as well as uh, its critics, because judicial, part of judicial um, um, accountability is understanding the, what judicial independence entails and being prepared to respect that, that um, concept as, as um, zealously as one is prepared to de uh, demand accountability. And ju the judiciary, at least in the, in the United States, it was never meant to reflect popular will. In fact, our judiciary was meant to protect minorities from the will of the majority. And a lot of people, um, you know, don't realize that. And so they can be, uh, in, in the name of judicial accountability, they can be some of the uh, biggest threats to, to judicial independence imaginable because they're trying to get judges to um, exercise, you know, their societal preferences. And if that had been the case, you know, the United States could not have ever moved its way, itself away from sanctioning um, slavery. And, and various other um, uh, institutions and practices that, that are now, um, you know, pretty universally considered a stain on, on, on our society. Um, so it, it cannot be, it's not just simply a matter of a judge should be implementing the popular will. So do, so do judges come under threat in America as they have here? And is police protection very often necessary? Well, there's been an increasing um, 
it, it's, it's a, the outcry or the concern about judicial safety has has not been as fervent as as it was, um, let's say in about three or four years ago, where um, judges, you know, were very concerned about their safety. But you know, part of the problem is judges were. Um, concerned about their safety because they felt that increasing public discontent, expressions of pu public discontent, public expressions of discontent about the judiciary, you know, th were a threat. And, and, and they, they went too far, in my opinion, in, in the correction by wanting to quell, you know, these expressions, these public expressions of discontent. So there has to be some type of uh, middle ground where um, the citizens can, you know, engage in a hearty public critique um, uh, of the judiciary, but, but without um, moving to the point that they create security threats and, and, and in fact undermine judicial independence. And any responsible judicial, um, you know, watchdog would, would make sure that there's always a, an appropriate balance between judicial independency and proper accountability. Do you have a particular problem in, in the United States, for example, where judges are sometimes elected or in the case of Supreme Court, chosen by the president in power at the time, which in a way makes the Supreme Court sometimes people think more of a legislative body than a judiciary one. Yes, there's a big debate in our country about the merits of judicial election versus judicial appointment or selection. I'm, I'm a big uh, proponent of judicial uh, election. Um, because I, I have uh, a confidence in, in the ability of private individuals to um, use that that power responsibly, and I I'm, I'm, I'm I believe, in fact, you know, my observations suggest that the selection process, the so-called merit selection process, simply makes it easier for um, to stack a judiciary with um, judicial officers that 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 represent a certain perspective and come from a, cer a certain a very limited institutional background. So um, you know there there's a tension, uh, but but it pretty much it all goes back to the, uh, private citizens and their willingness to recognize the important role of our judiciary, how. Um, how much the, ju the judiciary can uh, impact our individual lives and public policy and industries and be willing to be part of through, you know, through lawful exercises of democracy, be, you know, getting their voice heard and, and, and being, you know, being stakeholders, getting their voice heard as stakeholders and being part of making sure we're selecting competent and honest judges and that, that, you know, that they go on to um, enforce due process, equal protection, and adhere to the rule of law. Well, Neil, Neil asked the question, well, how do you get citizens to do that? Because, you know, the judiciary is probably the least known part of the uh, government or the governance system. People don't know much or they're not that interested in the judiciary. On one hand, on the other hand, judges have a higher rating of trust than politicians do. And there's that sort of contradiction. People don't know much about it, but judges are trusted more than politicians. How do you get citizens to translate their interest and their, their, their trust in judges into citizens' activity to understand what they're doing? Well, we, we embraced that subject uh, a few years back, and the consensus seems to be is that it's going to take a balance of um, volunteer and compulsory participation on the part of private citizens. So, for example, um, making uh, courses that are targeted, creating uh, more understanding, knowledge and understanding of how a judicial a judiciary operates, part of um, mandatory civics ed education on, on, on various levels of, of education, um, you know, grammar, you know, starting in high school and post-secondary level. Um, our organization um, proposes that uh, we have a, a, essentially a grand jury uh, function with regard to judicial discipline, where people are obliged to participate, much like you know being called for a jury, and it's compulsory. 
So, and, 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 and at that point, they, they are for a limited term involved in considering whether judges are complying with their ethical obligations uh, in the course of resolving legal disputes. Uh, then, you know, we have also other, um, you know, formulas where uh, on the college level where um, you have like you have uh, journals, law review journals, and some of the focus is on evaluating how our, our uh, federal courts are operating, uh, the cases that are presented to our Supreme Court, but not uh, uh, um, not granted uh, review. We would have um, law students writing about those cases and, and, and sharing their opinion about whether whether it was uh, a good outcome that these cases were not reviewed or that whether they think they should have been reviewed by our high, our high court. So unfortunately, you know, um, most of the time pri private citizens need a little prodding and, and, and they can have that happen through um, these forums where we talk about the importance of um, you know, this judicial oversight. And then also to a certain extent, we make it compulsory through education process, uh, jury service and, and that sort of thing. Okay, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about corporations and uh, several people are obviously very concerned about them. Neil continuously on his points, uh, uh, really saying, you know, corporates rule the roost, what can we do about it? But what evidence have you got, or do you have any, Zena, of corporate pressure on the legal system? Can you cite certain things that you can make clear to people this is corporate pressure, or is it all done secretly behind closed doors? Hmm. Well, you know, what happens, you, you have a few cases of, uh, that get a lot of major media attention. And they have suggested that there's a, a, a undue deference on the part of even our nation's highest courts to corporate interests. But, you know, just when, you know, our, our judiciary is savvy enough to counter those type of rulings with, you know, the occasional victory that, that very much uh, caters to individual rights, for example, employee rights. So ultimately what, what um, our organization starts a, to address is the question of whether um, someone has been subjected to an injustice, um, whether they've been subjected to uh, un improper judicial bias uh, in favor of a large corporation or a government entity or, or any other, um, you know, litigant that before the, the court. court. The, the, we can vouch for, you know, the truth uh, or the accuracy of that assessment. But what we want to ensure is that we have a country that those claims can be uh, fairly and in partially addressed in a timely manner. And the big difficulty that we're having in our country is that regardless of your evidence, regardless of the sophistication of your advocacy, we have people going for decades um, and, and, and from one, um, regular, one oversight agency to another and um, leaving with a, a very understandable belief that they have not gotten a fair and impartial consideration of their um, of their uh, complaint, and these these so these um, oversight mechanisms have, have proven elusive and, and so ineffective in protecting individual rights in the face of um, you know large corporate interests are are um, the protectiveness of, of of our judiciary that now we're going to be um, addressing it as um, inter international human rights treaty violations because all members of, of the UN um, uh, nation states uh, pledge that they will make sure that there are effective mechanisms for protecting the rights of their citizens from um, abuses of power under color of law. You, you mentioned human rights legislation and we have it in the UK and we have European human rights legislation and we have the European Court of Justice. To what extent has human rights legislation helped to redress the balance against corporations and the undue use of authority? Mm, well, the juries are still a bit out on that because finally uh, problems with um, perceived threats to individual rights 
um, have escalated to the point that they can be fairly characterized as human rights uh, considerations and um, be addressed as a, a sovereign uh, problem as opposed to uh, the misconduct of individuals or the misconduct of particular um, government entities, particular courts. So, um, but, you know, even when you get to the international level and you're talking about human rights as opposed to civil rights or constitutional rights, it's still going to be uh, uh, the obligation of private citizens to, um, you know, make their concerns known and bring the pressure to bear of public, bring public scrutiny pressure to bear. So we're not going to be able to put our governments on autopilot and go home. We're going to have to be, you know, participate, you know, attending these type of webinars, participating in town hall meetings, and, um, you know, again, uh, making, being part of um, making our, our, our concerns um, heard through the ballot box. Well, I think, you know, that participatory approach is something that Paul would be interested in because he said something really interesting that you may want to respond to. And he says he thinks the integrity of any judiciary is going to be related to the quality of our democratic process. And our democratic process at the moment is in a bad way. And we've got to reform our democracy in order to get a better judiciary. And, and that you just summed up it, exactly everything that that I th I think the pivotal point that we sh we we're going to have to take from you know this discussion, it 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 all is tied to the viability uh, the vitality of our democratic process, and you know I, I get accused a lot of time of victim blaming, um, you know but. As private citizens, it's easier, for, you know, everybody loves to, to, to hate the lawyers and the judges, you know, um, say, you know, all, we all know Shakespeare recommendations of, of what, what constitutes a good solution and, you know, have, have all the lawyers at the bottom of an ocean. But as private citizens, um, we, we uh, need to do uh, some mirror looking and, and recognize that, you know, the big part of the solution is solidarity you know, our, our uh, harnessing a, a political power, um, being engaged, being part of the political process, um, letting our public officials know that, you know, if they don't uh, appropriately heed our priorities and, and, and will, you know, that they're not going to be able to stay in office. And, you know, that's, that's the way it's done. I, I know that it's, it's, um, you know, time consuming. A lot of people have been advocating for justice for a long time. And even though they've done a lot and they've been doing it for a long time, not, you know, re relatively rare have they been, you know, doing it in such a way that um, you know, they tend to want to sort of protest our way to justice, you know, um, petition our way to justice. Uh, and, but, but, but relatively few are willing to get out and, and be part of uh, election processes and come to town hall, hall meetings. Um, it, 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 I, I call it, uh, a lot of people want sca scandal-based reform. And, you know, if you have a legislator that, that's engaged in some type of blatant um, uh, improprieties, um, perhaps sexual misconduct, we've seen a rash of high uh, public figures in, 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 not, in the United States in the entertainment industry be fired because people have come out and, and, and accused them of, of sexual harassment. And, you know, so people are, you know, people take a note from that and they think that's all we have to do. We need to just get this misconduct exposed and then you know everything that would be better but it's a lot different you know describing and convincing someone that a certain uh, sexual conduct is improper um, than it is you know convincing you that a judge's resolution of a complex case was improper improper. You know, this second situation, the judicial situation, is not amenable to, to, to sound bites, media sound bites, and um, it's not often uh, amenable to that. Um, uh, hashtag reform. And, you know, when, when you have a problem with a judge that is amenable to that type of advocacy, the result tends to be perhaps, you know, perhaps getting a single judge uh, removed. 
But when you're trying to get fundamental reform of a legal system, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a more complex endeavor. And, and private citizens, understandably, you know, don't have the patience for that. Well, you know, some of us do. And, and, and what happens is, you know, we have to find a way to, to sustain this advocacy. Perhaps you don't want to do it full time, but be supportive of an organization that does do it full time if you support, you know, their tactics and, and their strategies and their objectives. Okay, well, we're coming very close to the end now. So um, maybe we could sort of end up with Paul's last point. Um, in, he says, why would citizens engage when they have no power in the current system or they perceive that they have no power? And is part of your organization's mission, Zena, to not only ensure the accountability of the judiciary, but improve the democratic process so citizens do feel empowered? Yes, we have all the power. You know, there's a lot more of us than it is of them. Um, you know, but what, what needs to happen is just a re-education and a reorientation of what power um, entails, what success looks like. Um, and, you, you know, uh, unfortunately, that a lot of, of the people who, who are, um, you know, looking at the situation are, you know, my age, the baby boomers, and um, we're taking lessons from the classic civil rights movements um, and what we saw is a lot of change that came about through um, direct action, sit-ins and, and, and marches in the street. And so that has not been uh, effective in, in bringing out uh, about fundamental reforms of the legal system. And as a result, we're frustrated and we're feeling uh, powerless. But um, what needs to happen is we just simply have to uh, better understand the difference between um, combating um, civil rights violations, even combating, um, you know, ab abuses of, of corporate power versus trying to bring about fundamental reforms of, of a legal system. Um, you know, it, 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 it is a more complex um, undertaking to, to um, you know, bring about the fundamental reform of the legal system. We have to uh, do what's necessary to convince um, the, the broader public that there, in fact, the legal system needs to be reformed. Okay, well, we've sort of come to the end, Zena. So do you want to, before we go, type up a link to your book so everyone okay. knows about it? Okay, and I very much um, in encourage everyone to, to look at it because we, we the book, uh, we brought together a very stellar panel of, of law professors and we uh, tackle some of these very issues that you all um, are, are uh, asking about. So, you know, we, we have, a, again, we have a lot more power than, than, than most of us perceive, and um, we can get this job done. We just have to be willing to be smart about it. Okay, well, thanks a lot for doing that. That was really interesting. We had some really good questions coming up, which uh, sort of explored some of the issues in depth. So, um, you know, I hope we do something with you again very soon in the new year. So thank you for doing that, Zena, and let me wish you and everyone on here a happy Christmas. And um, we'll see you all again in the new year. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll end this webinar now. Thank <laughs> you.